Welcome to Labor Lens. I am Sharon Ijasson. On this week edition of the program, we'll be discussing about the organized private sector. Vis-a-vis -vis the several challenges the economy is faced with, especially that of COVID-19 pandemic. We will be right back. A report by the International Labour Organization, ILO, has said migrants who left their countries in quest of greener pastures become worse off than they were. African migrants, most especially women, who seek greener pasture in Arab countries, are subjected to sexual assault and other cruel treatments. We are here to develop, to allow, to teach our officers on how to cope and how to treat the migrants as they come to Nigeria. That's where we are here to educate them, educate our social partners on the effect of or the impact of COVID. COVID is not likely to hang on to the young people. But I want to advise that whatever the situation, try and keep to the COVID protocol. And if possible, try and get the vaccine. It's very important. And I'm sounding it very clear, loud and clear to everyone that is out there. COVID is real and we must take all precautions to avoid it. Wear your mask, sanitize your hand if you cannot have if you don't have access to running water immediately, sanitize your hand and follow the NCDC pro, uh, pro, uh, uh, procure, uh, protocol on COVID. According to the ILO, Migrant workers rose to 169 million worldwide in 2019. The distribution showed that 68.1 million, or 41.6 percent, were female. And there's no point going to, you know, a the training supported employers' organizations to adapt advocacy efforts on labor migration to the context of the pandemic in Nigeria. It enhanced employers' awareness of emerging dynamics in labor mobility fair recruitment and the future of work in the post-pandemic era. We're talking about effective labor migration in the context of COVID-19 and we've been talking to various beneficiaries. We are trying to ensure that um, the elements of effective labor migration um, that the ILO has identified are complied with, with um, by all countries. Nigeria is a receiving country of migrants across the globe has a mixed migration profile, so um, it's also a net sending country um, across the globe. So we're trying to make sure that um, Algeria understands what it means to protect migrant workers, um, to it understands recruitment practices, admission practices, post-admission practices, and all of the other elements of effective labor migration. The federal government, through support of partners, has developed or has established the migrant resource centers. We have three migrant resource centers right now, one in Edo State, one in Lagos State, and one in Abuja. It is our belief and understanding that information and capacity gained within these next two days will be cascaded across the respective migrant resource centers and contributes to personnel development and also in ensuring that the knowledge gain is used to impact on migrant workers or potential migrants and returning migrants that visit these centers at the respective locations, thereby enhancing and contributing to the protection of the rights of migrant workers in Nigeria. It was noted that the COVID-19 crisis has intensified vulnerabilities, particularly for women migrant workers, as they are overrepresented in low-paid and low-skilled jobs and have limited access to social protection and fewer options for support services. This one is 500 naira, 600 naira. They are not really buying it much because it's too expensive. It's because there is, um, they don't bring it from farm. So all the people that they are doing it from farm, they say they know, they know, they don't, they don't want to stay the farm. So when they are tomato, but from now, now there's nothing like that. It starts from 500 now. Before you even see 200 naira tomato to serve, you, you, you do like this. Because, because it's expensive, it's not the same um, quantity that, that you buy before. So it does not last. Now, mainly the small basket, 
you can get in the market, which now sells for 16 to 20,000 naira. But now it is very expensive. The basket of tomatoes that we sell for 1,000 naira is now 3,500 naira. Hopefully, very soon, the price will reduce. So, do you want to shake out our own local tender? Why not other? Tomatoes of 1,000 cannot take us for three days. When I mean three days, it can't take us for three days. You have to buy tin tomatoes. And if you don't take tin tomatoes, so I don't know how you manage it. So, it's not easy at all. It's just small container of the tomatoes. They sell 300 naira. And inside, you get like five or six inside. So, it's so expensive now, very expensive. The basket we were buying for around uh, 3,000, 4,000. Now we're buying for around 20 something thousand. So you just imagine the margin. So if we don't sell it high to it, we can't make anything. It's not our fault that it's high, but then there's nothing we can do. I used to buy the crate of tomato three months ago, 800, 700, but now it's 20,000, 22, 23. Crate, I'm not talking about the basket too. I'm talking about the crate of tomato. That but I want to have like a big basket now. You have to have like a maybe more just say less 50k. Yes. You're gonna have three crates. That crate is so now three they full one big basket. That's the biggest basket. Actually everything here is um I would like to say triple the price or more than triple because um things we actually get for two two hundred naira. Now they are saying each we are getting it for like eight hundred naira. And you can see that it's very I can't I can't even buy anything. I came to market, I've been pricing going around. I can't get anything. As of last year, they used to buy it uh, 20,000, 30. But as of this year, would you believe that they bought tomato? 50 something thousand a basket. That's why they're selling to 1,000 now per cup. If, if the government can prove those things for those people and help the farmers that is bringing in, and also the way that they're using to bring that, that thing, like roads. In this Delta state, that they bring in all those things, it's very bad. We like say the government should help us in terms of um, um, helping us with agriculture and um, in terms of um, the fuel. Uh, when you know when you increase the fuel price, everything in the market goes up. You understand? So if they can help us, at least reduce the the price of fuel, the cost of fuel, then help to in agriculture so that all these things we can get it. I wonder, me here, I can't even get it. Then I wonder what. Um, People that are not working, what they will do, you know, this starvation, you understand, it's, it's, everything is expensive. Our customers, we don't used to see customers before a day. All of them went, come and buy, they say, ah, tomatoes, ah, na na go do, ah, nobody will buy the tomatoes now. And so, we are losing customers now. When them please, they made them talk about the price for less for us, so that, we are able to get our customer back. On the Profile Interview segment this week, I will be speaking with the president of the Nigeria Employers Consultative Association. He tells me about the several challenges the manufacturing sector is faced with, how it affects workers, and what can be done to ensure that the inflation rate, which is high at the moment, is being reduced to the barest minimum. It's good to have you on the program. Thank you. The COVID-19 pandemic is still ravaging the world and, and the businesses seem to be the worst hit. Um, how would you see organized businesses in Nigeria responding to this? In spite of the pandemic, we have seen results of most of the organizations that have been published this year. We find that um, uh, appreciable progress has been made. What has just happened is that people have found a way to adapt to new ways of doing business. So we can only hope that it will get better if we have the, the kind of support that is expected of government in this type of environment. So I would say that yes, for government, I mean for businesses, it's been very challenging the year with all kinds of um, going from forex to inflation to scarcity of forest infrastructural deficit. So it's been quite uh, a challenging period for, for businesses in Nigeria. Looking at the current realities that Nigeria is faced with, would you say that the government has given the organized private sector friendly policies that will make um, 
organized private sector or businesses thrive? Yes, again, um, government unemployment. You find that as of today, we're talking about um, double digits. And majority, given the kind of um, um, population that we have, you can be sure that in the neighborhood of that will be about 80% of youth that are unemployed out of the 3.3% that we talk of unemployment uh, rate as of today. But you find, again, that the problem has been there. It's just unfortunate that the pandemic compounded it. Go back to our universities. Every year on an annual basis, they turn out graduates. But who is it that monitors the statistics or take data of how many of those graduates are employed, even before now? You find out that the university teach them, invest in them in terms of training, and they send them off. But so, what the government is now trying to do is to say that as part of the training back in the universities, we must then introduce some level of entrepreneurship training. So, you now see some form of collaboration between the industry and also the, 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 the institutions. Institutions are now establishing entrepreneurship schemes that will allow our graduates not only to gain theoretical knowledge, but also gain practical knowledge that will enable them to be employed, I mean to employ, to be self-employed when they leave the university environment. It's just that it's coming um, well, maybe better late than never. But a lot more. We're supposed to be doing much more than we're doing now to be able to close the gap. Because the gap is huge. Every year, look at the number of universities. We establish more and more universities in Nigeria. People are graduating from the past. Where are they going to? Even the kind of the businesses that are running today, I mean, how many can they employ? Now, that's about those that are even employable. You also have a group out of that number we're talking about that are not employable. You sit at interview panels and you're listening to graduates and you're wondering, where are you going to put this one? And they all have wonderful certificates but yet they are not employable because the, the the training that is required of them to be able to add value to whichever environment they are employed is not there which is why some of the industries are now going back and some of the universities have now accepted the fact that okay some industry uh, leaders can actually come back to be adjunct lecturers to provide the industrial training that is required for the graduates. So that if, for instance, a company is a technical company. Now, as a technical company, you have to partner with the likes of the engineering department of universities around you and go there to provide what is required of their graduates so that they can tailor some of their courses to make them available for you in the long run. So that way, we will be able to close the gap. But it's, it's, it's way, way, um, way, way ahead of us. Unemployment is on the rise um, in the country and also maybe in Africa. Um, can you give us updates on this development and um, give us solutions in terms of um, what recommendations would be preferred to government or relevant stakeholders to ensure that more jobs are being created for the youth? Well, I'll tell you, one of what, what is that? I, I, mean, I mean, in terms of um, what the ratio should look like, it's more of the fact that the private sectors are not getting enough support from government. Not on the when somebody sits down to appreciate the fact that employability in government is not, it does not have as much impact on the economy as you have of the organized private sector. The organized private sector, the employment in the organized private sector have direct impact on the economy because they employ much more than that can add value to the economy and change the data that we see of the economy of today. But what has happened? Most of those companies in the organized private sector, by reason of the recent happenings, are folding up. 
So if they are folding up, what is happening is that people then run to government. And government keeps creating people that can carry files all over the place and say they are employed. That do not have value to the economy. So all we're asking government to do is to beam their satellite and have more time looking at the challenges of organized private sector to be able to provide solutions as quickly as possible so that in the, in the long run, they are able to provide more employment opportunities. And that would reduce automatically the number of people that we have in the unemployment bracket. That's what has to happen. Right. Policies of government must be taken apart to make sure that every of their policy is geared towards supporting the organized private sector. The Nigeria Employers Consultative Association recently um, awarded um, some organized private sector members that are actually doing well. Um, can you bring us up to speed on this development? Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, yes, we, NECA, the Nigeria Employers Consultative Association, recently had an award night um, basically to, to appreciate residents in a number of the organized businesses that we have in this environment. Um, one thing we, we, we strive to do is to make sure that we recognize performance, we recognize excellence, we recognize resilience, because in the face of the challenges of this environment, we find out that some of our companies are still pushing forward. And so what did NECA do? To encourage them to continue to do more, we decided to have an award night to recognize those, of those, I mean, those companies that are still fighting on in the various sectors they represent. And so we gave award to them um, as an award of excellence, award recognizing that yes, in spite of the happenings in the society as of today, you are still pushing, I mean, you are still pushing on. And that really encouraged them. Again, it was an opportunity for all of us to come together to, again, um, have some, some uh, time together, uh, exchange ideas, rub minds, to be able to help ourselves to push forward in this business um, environment that we are, where, that we're all uh, Will you encourage um, a comprehensive um, tax reform to widen tax income, revenue, and objectivity administration with your um, level of experience in the manufacturing sector? Yes, of course. And this has been our cry. That beyond, beyond just sitting down and then imagining that, okay, um, let's see, if we increase VAT, and then all that somebody is doing is that, okay, VAT is 5%, we are moving it from 5%, to 7.5%, oh, we have been able to rake in another 2.5%. And then you now find that after, that, after that, the next thing that has happened now is that a number of government agencies and processors are now looking at creating trust funds. For instance, you have the police trust fund, which again is another tax in itself. Oh, we need to help, we need to make provision to continue to sustain our police force in Nigeria. And then you say, police trust fund. And you force organizations to also do what? Contribute to police trust fund. Another tax. So rather than just continue to come up with names to be able to get more money from businesses, why don't we sit down and look at the, all of the tax nets that we have? Rather than increase the burden on those who now pay tax, can we look at what other thing can we do to bring to widen the net? I tell you today, go and check the percentage of people that pay that pay tax. It's it's it it will it will amuse you to find that we still have greater percentage of people not paying tax. The artisans, those who see your your organizer on the road, who uses the same facility that those who produce in large corporations do, they enjoy the same electricity, they enjoy the same road, 
yet they are working, but they are not paying tax. So why don't you find a way to bring those ones into the tax net? No matter how small, review what the tax law says and bring them in. So that if you have as many of them coming in, it increases the tax bucket eventually. The issue of unemployment is actually huge in this part of the country or even in the part of the world. Um, looking at the current realities that we're faced with, what do you think the government or relevant stakeholders need to do to ensure that more jobs are being created? Well, the moment you mention tax, to be honest with you, um, nobody wants to. But you know, the way it is now, the more you earn, um, the more tax you pay. And so, um, you find employees now even looking at you to your face when you say you have increased their salary and they look at you and say, tax will take everything. So, the moment you mention the word, the moment you mention the word tax to any employee, they just turn off. But it's an obligation that must be met. So, we really don't have a choice. Tax must be paid. We're saying that, okay, the more we pay tax, can we have better amenities around us. I'm, and I give it to, to, to the likes of the governor of Lagos State, to be quite honest with you. We are at the forum where we said, look, um, those of us who operate from Obakran, for instance, why should we have bad roads? If you look at, Obakran is supposed to be an industrial, um, uh, an envir um, industrial environment, industrial enclave. So I say, why should we have bad roads in Obakran Avenue? And it's talked to the governor. And good enough, two, three weeks after, Look at Obakran as of today. You hardly will find a pothole in the long stretch of Obakran. That's the kind of thing we want. Look at where, look at pockets of environments where you have a concentration of, say, industries, concentration of, look at the percentage of tax in your tax revenue. Okay, this environment contributes this much to this tax revenue. Now go there and make sure that you encourage them give them infrastructure that will make them to continue to feel good paying tax. That's what we encourage. What impact will a predictable and strong policy framework have or for the organized private sector in Nigeria? See, Sharon, it cannot be better put. It has always been our desire that whenever government is forming a policy for the organized private sector, involve industrial leaders, industry leaders, to be able to sit around the table and suggest to you, we're not saying we want to take a decision for you, I mean, to, 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 to ask you to go in our way, but let's suggest to you what and what we expect, look at it in the framework of ethics and let it be, so that we can all be better for it. We cannot run away from running this, we are running this economy together. It is for the good of every Nigerian if organized private sector can continue to strive. So we're saying that, okay, for you to be able to achieve that is your work, we know. But in being able to achieve it, we want to assist you. We want to be able to tell you that this is what is required for you to have a very good uh, result of your effort. So put them together, sit them down, and the policies that you bring out, we will support it and it will work for all. Thank you very much for your time. And that's all we can take on today's edition of the program. Join us next week for a fresh edition of the show. I am Sharon Ijasson. Thanks for watching and remember that labor creates wealth.